Well, Jesus has a way of ruffling feathers, doesn't he? He has a way of provoking people, and, and when Jesus ruffles your feathers, and he does, there's really two responses that happen. One is that we tend to harden our heart and we begin to oppose him and his work. The other is that we become convicted of our, of our sin, and often where we are not seeing things rightly, and it softens our heart. And we begin to bring ourselves into alignment with who he is. A lot of times Jesus provokes us because he doesn't necessarily meet the expectations that we have for him. And in many ways, that was Jesus' life in a nutshell. When he finally gets to Jerusalem, he is welcomed with fanfare and people crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Essentially, save us, Son of David, come and overthrow Rome. That's, that's what people thought, that the Messiah is here. Finally, we get to get rid of these tyrants and we can get back to living peaceable lives. Well, the first thing that Jesus does upon entering is drive out all the merchants and money changers in the temple grounds. Rather than purging the temple area from Gentiles, he actually does it for Gentiles. He says, this place will become a, a place of prayer for all of the nations. And so it, it would be an understatement to say that Jesus did not meet their expectations. So if Jesus came in on Sunday, and then he cleared the temple and cursed the fig tree, showing God's condemnation over the temple and its entire system on Monday, then what we see it, today is Tuesday. And Tuesday could probably best be described as the day of conflict. The day in which Jesus butts heads with all of the religious leaders. And, and being conflict and being northern Minnesota, it makes us feel all warm and cozy inside, doesn't it? Now what we see in, in, um, in the passage this morning is that Jesus and his disciples have, have come into the temple. And, and we looked at Latin two weeks ago that, that the, the religious leader said, Hey, who, who gave you authority to do these things, to clear the temple grounds, to teach the way that you do? And, and Jesus kind of rebuffs their answer, and he says, my dad in heaven. And he tells this parable directed directly at the religious leaders, which basically outs them, and it leaves them furious. It leaves them in this position, verse 12 of chapter 12. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Now they went away, but they, but they came back, and they came back with their ducks in a row, and their attempt was to trap Jesus and to publicly discredit him because he had spoken out against them. So that's the context of what we're going to see Jesus today. We, we see the religious leaders going on the offensive, trying to trap Jesus in his words. Let's read verse 13 of chapter 12. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, teacher... We know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Now that's buttering him up, isn't it? That's like classic, Dad, you're the best. Can I have some money? Right? My kids aren't actually that bad on that. But they're, they're basically, they're pumping him up a little bit, and then they're going to they're gonna hit him with a zinger question. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And the Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they, are, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? 
He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. How did Jesus get to this particular day where he encounters and goes toe-to-toe with all of the religious leaders and political leaders of his day? You know, one of the things that the people agreed about in Jesus' day was that Rome was awful. That to live under the rule and the reign of Rome, its tyrannical and oppressive rule, was miserable. And all of them wanted to be set free. Now, the way they approached that freedom, the way they longed for that freedom, the way that they hoped for God to come and deliver them was incredibly different depending on who you were, and what particular camp you ascribed yourself to. What we see is we see people called Herodians and Pharisees and Sadducees. In other places, we hear about the Zealots. And, and then if you, if you study the times at all, there were, there were other people called the Essenes. In light of this passage, it's helpful to know who are all of these people. Who are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Essenes, the Zealots? And why is it that there's all of these factions during the time of Jesus? Because it seems like they only unite in their opposition to Jesus. These different factions, in many ways, reveal the way that people thought about God's deliverance and they thought about the Word of God. The Herodians were the people in Jesus' day who were, who were not very religious at all. They had, uh, of, of all the people, kind of made peace with Rome. They were the ones who kind of promoted the status quo. They were supporters of King Herod the Great and Herod Antipas and, and all of the, the, the King Herods that we read about in the Scriptures. Well, they, those kings weren't actually of the line of King David. They were kings that had come out of what was called the Hasmonean Revolt uh, during about the 2nd, 3rd century B.C. that under the reign of the Seleucid Empire, now I'm throwing out a bunch of uh, titles that you're probably like, Kyle, I did not pay attention in history. Well, let me fill it in for you. Uh, when Alexander the Great died, he, he left an heir who was a child. And, and so this vast empire was divided into four main sections. Uh, for, for the purposes of God's people the, uh, in Israel, the two main uh, sections or whatever that tended to war against each other were the Seleucids in Syria and the Ptolemies in Egypt. Um, the Ptolemies, they, they, were, they were two of Uh, Alexander the Great's generals. Well, they went back and forth, and often in the middle of them was the nation of Israel, the people of God, and they kind of, uh, when one rose, the other kind of fell, when one rose, uh, and vice versa, and they kind of were tug of war in between them. Well, during the reign of one of them, a guy by the name of Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, he liked to call himself Epiphanes, meaning vision of God himself. He was a really humble guy. Um, he came, and, and one of the things that he tried to do to, to enforce the rule of law in his territory was to make everybody culturally Greek, was to get them to reject their own religions and to embrace the, the, Jew, uh, the Greek pantheons of gods. It was a process called Hellenization. Well, there was a guy by the name of Judas Maccabees and, and his father, Matthias, who, who, who started a revolt after Antiochus IV came to Jerusalem and sacrificed a pig to Zeus in the, in the center of the very temple of God. That's incredibly offensive, right? To take an unclean animal, to sacrifice it to a pagan god in the Holy of Holies, devoted only to the worship of Yahweh. 
Well, because of that, the Jewish people began to revolt, and they started this guerrilla warfare, so to speak. And, and for a moment, for a brief moment, the only time in the last 500 years, they, they gained their independence under Judas Maccabees. Well, in order to kind of keep peace, they allowed the, the, the descendants of Judas Maccabees and the Hasmoneans to rule and reign. They were the Herods, so to speak, political maneuverers, so to speak. And, and when Rome came and, and conquered Greece, they were content to let Herod function as a puppet king. And so that was the political situation that Jesus found himself in. The, the Herodians were the people who kind of embraced the status quo. They weren't super religious. They wanted to keep the peace. And rather than revolt and, and, and throw everything, they're just like, well, this is probably as good as it's going to get. Let's just not fight about it. And so they were big supporters of Herod the Great and his descendants. Now, the Sadducees were the religious liberals of their day. They were those who rejected the, the Old Testament books of the prophets and history as being the actual scriptures of, of God, and they only embraced the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were the religious liberals of their day because they denied things like the resurrection. They denied the more supernatural elements of the Old Testament, and though they were a uh, a minority among the people, they were a powerful minority among the religious elites, and they were the ones who actually were in political power from a religious standpoint. And so the Herodians and the Sadducees would often partner together. So if you've heard of the Sanhedrin, that was the group of 70 Jewish people who condemned Jesus to death. They were kind of ruled over by the Sadducees. They were the party, so to speak, that was in power. The chief priest was a Sadducee. So Ananias and Caiaphas, they were Sadducees. And though they hadn't fully made peace with Rome, they kind of made the best of it. And they kind of made all of these religious compromises in order to gain political power and religious power. The Pharisees were the religious conservatives of their day. They were the ones who felt like they were under the, the judgment of God because they had not been good enough. They had not kept the covenant. They had not kept the law like God had called them to keep the law. And so their way of, of, of gaining deliverance that God would come and overthrow Rome was if, if they were moral enough if they kept the law. And so they, they made religiosity and following all of the little details of the law paramount because in that they felt that if they did it well enough, God would come and deliver them. Now the two others that aren't mentioned here but are important, one was the zealots. They were the terrorists of the day, okay? They were the ones who believed in the worship of Yahweh but th felt that the only way that they were going to gain their independence was, to, was, was through violence and, and kind of guerrilla warfare. And so zealots were known for knifing Roman soldiers in the back. Uh, people, th they were the terrorists of their day. They were the extremists. Uh, Jesus had one of those in his disciples, Judas, the zealot. He also had a tax collector who was probably more of the Herodian branch. So uh, if, if Jesus can unite different political parties, he can do that today, right? Amen? Anybody? No? Okay. His kingdom is bigger than all of that? And then finally, wow, well, I'm, I'm, you're like, well, you're out on a limb now, pastor. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the Essenes, they were the ones that aren't mentioned because they, in many ways, hit the eject button on culture. They said, you know what? It is so screwed up that the only way that we can honor and serve God is completely withdraw from culture. And what they did is they set up their own kind of monastic communities in which they served and followed God by themselves. So if you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that was most likely an Essene community who had kind of hit the eject button from culture and just kind of went out and did their own thing. So that was the status of the different people in their day, which if you think about it, our responses aren't that much different, are they? We have the religious conservatives, we have the religious liberals, we have kind of the secularists, we have those who are like, no way, this world is so messed up, we're just going to leave, and then we have some terrorists, right? Some extremists. Jesus comes into all of that, and he ruffles all of their feathers. Not only that, but they see him as such a threat that two of the most unlikely partners partner together in order to oppose Jesus. Did you see that? The Herodians and the Pharisees. The people who had nothing in common other than their opposition of Jesus, seeing him as a threat, decide to link arms in order to trap him in his words. And so the first story is that they come up and they're like, all right, we got him with this one. Jesus, should we pay taxes? Now, if you look at that, it's, it's a trap, right? Admiral Akbar would warn Jesus, it's a trap, watch out. Why was it a trap? Because for Jesus to declare one way or another would have made some people really happy and some people really unhappy. For Jesus to say, no, don't worry about it. Don't pay your taxes. The Romans are evil. Why would we want to fund a, an, an, an oppressive regime to continue oppressing us? Do you think he would have found himself at odds with the, with the Roman government? 
If I were to say this morning, all right, from this point forward, nobody pay taxes, and you did, I, I, I bet I would probably get a knock or a phone call or something like that, wouldn't I? If on the other hand, Jesus says, you know what, pay your taxes. You know what that would have done for him? That would have been for many of them, Jesus' endorsement of Rome's rule over them. And so many of the common people had welcomed him, declaring Hosanna, son of David, because they thought in Jesus was their deliverance. He was going to overthrow Rome, and so he was popular among the crowds and among the people because they thought, okay, here it is. Here it starts. Rome is going bye-bye. If he would have said, okay, everybody pay your taxes, he would have probably lost all of that base of support, which is the way that the Herodians and the, and the Pharisees thought. They thought only of political power and influence. And so Jesus, getting this question, which is almost like, hey, what's your stance on gay marriage? Or how do you feel about immigration law and enforcement? Like, people ask those questions because they want you to out yourself so that they can dismiss you with a label. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He says... Rather than take the bait, he flips it on his head. He says, bring me one of those denarius. Bring me one of those coins. It, it, it would have looked like that. That was Tiberius Caesar. Uh, it was a Roman denarius of their day. He says, you know what? Who's, whose likeness, whose image is on that coin? Well, anybody with eyes were like, well, this isn't a trick question. That's, that's Caesar. He says, all right, this is what I want you to do. I want you to give to Caesar that which bear the image of Caesar. But this is what I want you to do for God. I want you to give to God what bears the image of God. They marvel. Not just at him weaving his way out, but do you, do you realize what he is calling them to? He says, okay, there are governing authorities, and, and part of living in this broken world is submitting ourselves to imperfect governing authorities because they... they, they they cover the rule of law and they restrain evil. And so that, that bears the image of Caesar. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But you know what you need to give to God? Your entire selves. Because what bears the image of God? We do. Jesus is not lessening the call among the followers of God, but rather increasing it a hundredfold. He says, oh, you don't just pay God your tax. No, you give him your very self, your very lives. You give God what bears the image of God. Now, we can sit back and say, wow, Jesus was really smart. I can't, I can't figure out how he got himself out of that. Or we could allow his response and his answer to provoke us where we ask, am I giving to God that which bears the image of God? Am I giving to God my entire self? Or do I see, do I treat God like he deserves a, a percentage of my life? God, you can have one day. I'll show up on Sunday. Or God, you can have 10% of my income. I'll give you that. I'll, I'll, I'll throw you a bone. I'll pay my taxes. I know how it goes. And God says, oh, no, 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 no. I demand far more than that. I demand your very self, your very life, your all. Why? Because you are not your own. You have been bought and purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we read this 2,000 years later in a very different form of government, how do we apply this? We give to God that which bears the image of God, our very selves and our lives. Now, if this was me and Jesus had responded so brilliantly and like owned me in front of everybody else, I would probably just tuck tail and walked away. But here come the Sadducees. They're like, oh, let, let me try. Hold my beer, right? Um, <laughs> sorry. These things, I should stick to my notes, shouldn't I? <laughs> he completely made the Pharisees and the Herodians look foolish. Now here come the Sadducees. They're like, hey, Jesus, I got a question for you. Can God create a rock that's so big that even he can't lift it? A, a, a logical absurdity, right? But, but, but sometimes philosophy 101 professors were like, oh, I don't know. They come up and they concoct this elaborate situation. Mark is careful to point out the Sadducees don't even believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so they're like, I got a good one for you, Jesus. And they concoct this elaborate scenario which puts into play the law of Leverite marriage, which was God's providence and plan for not only caring for widows, but also perpetuating the name of, of family members who died childless so that they wouldn't die in shame and without honor. It was his way of kind of guarding that and perpetuating the legacy or the name of those who are deceased as a way of, and also a way of caring for widows who are extremely vulnerable. And they're like, there was this, these seven brothers, 
And they all had her as wife, and none of them had any kids, and they all died childless. Now, this is such an absurd story, right? I mean, if it was real, how would you feel if you were the fourth brother, right? Like, uh uh-oh, this is not going to go well for me. (laughs) But he says, all right, in the resurrection, which I don't even believe in, whose wife is she? Because they were trying to play a game of gotcha. See, the, the resurrection is absurd. We can't see that. That's supernatural. We're, we're wrong to hope in something like that. And Jesus responds directly but graciously, and he says, is this not the reason that you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. The problem is not that ridiculous scenario. It is your hearts of unbelief See, most of the teaching of the resurrection fell in the, in the books of the history and of the prophets. And so the, the Sadducees saying, hey, we only, we only receive Moses' books, the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. And therefore, the resurrection is just kind of a fairy tale, a figment of people's imagination that they tell each other to, to make them cope with the reality of Rome being so hard and oppressive. Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures. And you don't know God. You don't know the power of God. Here you are in these positions of religious authority. Here you are giving the definitive word on yes, receive this teaching, no, receive that teaching, and you don't even know the Bible. You certainly don't know the power of God. It's not a stretch to say that there are many pulpits and many churches that gather that are filled by men and women who do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. And they pontificate and pontificate, and they never bring people to Jesus, our only hope. But Jesus engages them. Not only does he he disagree with them, but he actually engages them in a way that they could understand. He says, first of all, you don't know what the resurrection is going to be like. Let me clarify that for you. And second of all, he shows from the Hebrew scriptures that they have received of how ridiculous their conclusion is even if they only have the first five books of the Bible. So first of all, he says, you don't understand the nature of the resurrection. It will be like this world, but not like this world. In fact, marriage in this world is but an appetizer to the real thing in the resurrection. It is only here to point us to a a reality that is infinitely deeper and more intimate and sweet than than the deepest of human relationships the covenantal love of a marriage. What Jesus is doing here as he teaches about the resurrection is relativizing romantic love, saying that marriage and romance and sex is not the end-all, be-all of life. Now, we are in a culture that is deeply in need of that message, aren't we? That romantic love and sexuality is not the high point of human existence, but an appetizer that points you to an even sweeter reality in the future. We learn later on in Ephesians chapter 5, as the Apostle Paul gives practical marriage advice, that, this, that marriage actually points to the relationship that we're to have with God. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's marriage. God ordained it, instituted it at the very beginning of creation. But why did he do that? This mystery is profound, but I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. What he is saying then is that marriage is iconic. It points to something beyond its very self. It points to the reality of the relationship that we are to have with God, with Jesus, our Savior, our true bridegroom and husband. That, that even the greatest of human marriages is an appetizer. Just prepares you for an even deeper reality. Now this is good news for all of us. Regardless of your status of a married, single, happily married, unhappily married. Because what it does is it takes the pressure off of that relationship. And it says that is actually about something deeper. If you are in a challenging marriage, this is good news for you in that even that relationship that you currently find yourself in is preparing for you something far sweeter and greater. If you're single and you want to be married, or you're single and you're happily single, 
This is good news for you because what it is telling you is that deep longing in your heart. Sometimes those, those nights that you wait, lie awake wondering, is anybody going to care about me? Am I going to journey through life on my own? Or, or will God give me the gift of marriage that my heart so desperately desires? The good news of this passage for you is that you can live a fully formed, human, flourishing life as a single person because marriage isn't the end-all, be-all. It's actually only something that helps you understand what your heart truly longs for. You're like, oh, that, that, it's one thing to say, Pastor Kyle, but you're happily married. I, I am, and, and in some ways I don't understand that anymore because that's not my daily reality. But what it does is it, it forces you to let Jesus fill in the gaps of your soul that you uniquely feel. And even in that moment, in that time of singleness, happy or otherwise, it is preparing you for an even deeper and better relationship of covenantal sweetness that any marriage in this world can't even touch. But what about you who are happily married? I'll be honest with you guys, I read this passage and I'm like, there's a little bit of sadness in me. One of the great joys of my life is being married to Liz. I love it. It's a sweet marriage. I married way over my head. I outkicked my coverage way, way far. And so when I read this and I think about heaven that I'm not going to be married to her or experience family like I do now, there's a sense in which I'm like, that doesn't sound like good news. I, I, I want, I, I, I'm not sure about this, Jesus. How is that good news for me then? Or if you have a sweet marriage, how is this good news? It, it means in the sweetest of moments, in the best that it ever is in romantic love, it's but a glimpse of what you were truly created for. C.S. Lewis tries to give an analogy that, that helps maybe understand that when we think it's so far beyond me to think of something like that. He says, it, it's like trying to talk to a young boy about the greatest of human pleasures, which in his mind is chocolate. And he tried to talk to him about sex and sexual intimacy as being something greater than even chocolate. And his initial response and question is, well, does it involve chocolate? And you're like, well, no, there's something better than that. And him being completely confused. And his understanding of sexuality is only the absence of chocolate. He says, for those who have the sweetness of marriage, who think, I don't know if that sounds good, we're like the little boy. That we can't fathom something more than what we've experienced. But even that is preparing us to experience the real thing. That's my paraphrase, but C.S. Lewis gave the illustration. I don't know if that's helpful to you, but what Jesus is doing here when talking about resurrection and marriage, he's saying even the best and the worst of human marriages cause in us a longing for the real thing. It's like I often say that your spouse can be an incredible spouse, but they're a lousy God. Because if you put them in that place, they will let you down over and over and over again no matter how great a spouse they are. And so Jesus looks at them, he says, you don't get it. You don't understand the scripture or the power of God, and you certainly don't understand what the resurrection is all about. Marriage is just a prep for something infinitely greater. Finally, he says, quoting their scriptures that they receive, it's like Moses. When the burning bush spoke and God spoke, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living so even you, in your little warped view of what the Bible is, should acknowledge the resurrection and hope for it. Whew. So three, three people try to trap Jesus and fail. And then there's a fourth. But he comes to Jesus with a very different approach and tone, doesn't he? We're told that he is a scribe, an expert in the law like a lawyer or a teacher of the law, uh, like a Bible scholar or a seminary professor combined with a lawyer because the law was still binding with them. And you're like, well, that makes my head explode. Just track with me. He's a Bible scholar and he is coming up and he is putting Jesus to the test. But as he sees them squabble with one another, he marvels at Jesus. And so he presents him with a real question. 
a real issue, the question, which was this, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? You see, there was over 600 different commands in the Old Testament, and if you tried to live them and tried to obey all of them, you would, you would learn very quickly that you are incapable of doing that. And so one of the questions that, that each rabbi talked about was, what is the weightiest, what is the most important of the commandments? And so he asks that to Jesus, and Jesus responds, and summarizes the entirety of the Old Testament law, 600 plus commands into two. He says this, the most important is, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He quotes the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter six, what every young Jewish boy and girl would have memorized from their earliest of, of days, that God is, is the only God. He is the one God. And we shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's the greatest commandment. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus summarizes the entirety of God's commands, all of the do not do this and do this, into two things, love God and love people. Love God with every fiber and shred of your being and love other people with the same tenacity and fervency that you love yourself and you'll be just fine. Go ahead and obey those two things and get back to me. Now, this scribe's response is different than the other three groups, isn't it? He affirms Jesus. He sees the wisdom in what Jesus has said here, but he doesn't yet get it. He says, you're right, Jesus. Those commands are more important than sacrifice and and festivals. But notice in this interaction at the end, Jesus says, you're close. You're not there yet, but you're close to the kingdom of God. Why would Jesus say that when he affirms what Jesus is saying? I think it's this, because he's still inhabiting the role of teacher and instructor and discerner of whether Jesus is legit or not. Jesus gives him a good answer, and like a student, he pats him on the head. He says, good teaching, teacher. You're okay. But what he doesn't realize, what we often, when we hear that, don't realize is that we haven't done it. We haven't loved God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, and with all of our mind, even for a day. We haven't loved our neighbor with the same tenacity and fervency that we love ourselves. See, you can boil those 600 commands down to two, and not for a day can we keep them when we actually understand them. See, this man was close in that he recognized, that's it. But he was oh so far away in that he didn't realize his need for the one who was instructing him. See, when we understand what God requires of us, and the, the Ten Commandments, the first four are about loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The last six are about loving our neighbor as ourself. Right? We see it broken down so clearly there. But But when we understand what God requires of us, it should do two things in all of us. One, it should help us realize that's how life is supposed to be lived. That's the way to truly find life, is to love God and to love people. It's to not think about myself all the time, but be captivated by something greater and then pour my life out for other people, and in doing that, I find life. But the other thing it should do has convict us of our need for a Savior, our need for Jesus to come and not just instruct us in what the law is about, but do it for us and die for us. That's how the gospel becomes good news because not only do we have to answer Mark's question, who is Jesus? He is the Messiah, the Son of God, but we have to answer the question, why did he come? And the answer to that is he came not just to teach us and instruct us about life, but he came to save us. He came to live the perfect life of righteousness because we didn't do it. He came to die as a substitute for us, bearing in his body the penalty for our sin because that's what we deserve to pay. And he came to rise in victory over Satan, sin, and death through his resurrection because in that it provides our hope and it, it confirms to us who he actually is. And so when we put our faith and our trust in him, his life becomes my life. His death pays my debt, and his victorious resurrection becomes my great hope. Something that I've found over the years that's been tremendously helpful for me in understanding this and actually trying to work it out in my life is this cross chart. 
See, there's, there's, a, there's a reality that comes when we, when we come to know Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. We become aware of a gap that exists between God's holiness and his standards for our life and our own performance. We become aware that there is a gap that we couldn't possibly bridge the chasm ourselves and connect the two because we have fallen so far short of God's standard. And in that moment, we cry out to Jesus in faith and he saves us. The cross spans the chasm. It spans the gap. And we are welcomed into the family of God. We are given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the perfection before God. We're judged on the basis of his resume, as it were. We are welcomed into the family of God. But even in that moment, our understanding of all that he has done for us is relatively small. Now, from that point forward, many people think, well, the way that you need to do the Christian life then is that, yes, we're saved by grace, but then we try really hard to love God and to love people. And if we do it well, then we're, we're, we're still good. We work it out. But the reality is something very different actually happens. The, the longer that we walk with Jesus, the more we become aware of just how high his standard is. What does it mean to love God with every fiber of your being? And that, and that our sin is actually far worse than we ever thought. That we're, we're far more messed up than we ever imagined. That it's not just the bad things I do, it's the wrong things that I think. And it's even the good things that I do with the wrong motives, not because I love God, but because I want everybody to think I'm awesome. And we realize that the rabbit hole goes way further down than we've ever imagined. And so we become aware that the gap is actually quite bigger. And in, this, in those moments, we look to the cross, and it becomes a far more compelling reality in our life. Our worship of Jesus grows. Our understanding of all that he has done for us explodes. And often in the midst of that, we grow in godliness. And we begin to see Jesus' commands here, not as a, this oppressive force on us, but rather an invitation to live life the way that it was meant to be lived. A way to love God because we were created to love God and worship him alone. A way to pour our lives out for other people because that's how we were created to live. That chart has been tremendously helpful in my life of what it looks like to live the Christian life is to realize all that Jesus has done for us over and over and over again. And so finally, where do we go from here? What do you do when Jesus ruffles your feathers? Do you harden or do you soften? In your life, do you give to God what bears the image of God, namely your whole self? Or do you just try to throw and cast him a bone every once in a while to try to keep him off your back? Oh, he deserves far more. No, he, he desires that you would love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And when we do that, we begin to view our neighbor differently, don't we? We love our neighbor as ourself, not because they are lovely, but because we're not lovely and God makes us lovely. We love them in the same way. Our lives overflow because we've been with God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word and how it provokes us and challenges us. I pray, Jesus, that we wouldn't put you to the test, but rather would be instructed by you so that we see our need for you. And Jesus, help us to worship you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In your name we pray, amen.